Amen, amen, amen. So how do you begin a Christmas message? Where do you come from? There's so many places. One could preach a Christmas message just from the entire Old Testament. Just from the Old Testament. Because everything we're looking at was foretold. Christ, who was born as the babe in Bethlehem, the second person of the triune Godhead, the creator put on clay. The infinite, the eternal I am, the infinite became an infant. And in a 45-minute to 60-minute message, 71-minute message, you know, where do you choose to come from? I mean, every story, all of it is so amazing. So you can imagine what the preacher feels before this day. And then you say, well, you know, this day, every Sunday is the day. Every week is the reason for the season. Every day is the reason for the season. But this is just that time when we really all, are, we lean in extra because we know that all of the world is leaning in and there's an opportunity here. So where do you come from? I want to come from Luke. I want to share some things that have just become precious to me all over again. And I pray that they become precious to you all over again. Now, as I look out in this room, I see those of you who are veteran saints. You've been saved for some time, walking with Jesus for some time. And those of you who maybe this is your first Christmas, you know, in church. You know, raise your hand if this is your first Christmas season as a believer, as a born-again believer. Right? Yeah, look at that. That's, a, that's awesome, right? So let's really consider one another here. You know what I mean? And that's what it means to be other-centered and family See, He's already doing it. That's why it's such a beauty and a blessing to come to church because oh, he's already, we haven't even gotten in the word that he's already doing that work, right? All right, let's go to Luke. I want to read from Luke, and we're just going to journey through, and we're going to stop along the way. Luke chapter 1, and let's look at verse 1. He says, For as much as many have taken in hand... To set forth in order a declaration of the things which are most surely believed among us. Underline most surely. Not maybe, most likely, what are most surely believed among us. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, Luke is saying, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek word. It means friend of God. So here's Dr. Luke. Luke is a physician. That's why when you read Luke's gospel, you see more of a focus on Christ the man. Yes, Christ, 100% God, 100% man. All God, all man, all the time. But with Luke's gospel as a physician, you see just focusing in more to Christ the man. That's why Luke's gospel is the only one that tells you that when he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane before he was betrayed and arrested, that he began sweating great drops of blood. That would resonate with Luke because being a doctor, there's a medical condition called hematohydrosis, where when you are under unspeakable emotional pressure, the capillaries or blood vessels in your sweat glands rupture and you literally begin to sweat blood. Um, you see more of Christ weeping in Luke, more of Christ's prayer life. And it's interesting because while Luke was written to the Greek, the Greek philosophers did nothing but sat around all day pontificating on what the ideal man was. So here comes Luke writing about Christ, the perfect man. So Luke is basically saying in the first set of verses, hey, as many have walked and been eyewitnesses, and as I also have been knowledgeable of all that went down from the beginning, I'm now going to share and I'm going to write this. And he's writing it to someone named Theophilus, which means friend of God. I believe that this was a person named Theophilus, but because it's friend of God, I believe that God, it's no coincidence Everyone that reads this should make themselves Theophilus. If you are a born-again believer, uh, you are a friend of God, so you can read this as though it's being written to you. That's the whole idea. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. 
Tradition says that he was actually one of the 70 when Christ began to send out the 70 to cast out demons and to heal and to preach. And he said, you know, no scup- you will tread on serpents and scorpions and nothing will hurt you. Some believe that he was part of the 70, but now he is writing. And he says that it's for this purpose, verse 4, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein you have been instructed. Here we are, and while the world in its progressive quote unquote, as we are living in what is now a post-Christian culture, you have those that perhaps look and say, well, wow, like with all that's going on and all of the innovation and rovers on Mars, you guys are still focusing on this story, right? The reality is this, though. What took place 2,000 years is still the largest religion in the world, It is still held to 2,000 years later. So what is beautiful is that here we are today, while the world is saying, really still? Uh, We're like, yeah, really still. They mean really still holding to that as though it means that we're stuck in the past. We're like, no, really still. Look at the 2,000-year track record. Have you just stopped to think about that for a moment? That here we are because we can let this culture make us feel as though uh, to bring this up and that 2,000 years ago is a bad thing. No, 2,000 years speaks of the track record, 2,000 years and the largest religion in the world, the largest body of worshipers are still celebrating this story in its simplicity and in its truth. Well, let's begin reading. Verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. He was of the course of Abiah. Would you write down of the course of Abiah? Let's keep reading. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. They were blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. She could not have children, and they were well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, underline that again, of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, underline that, the custom of the priest's office, His lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So let's just look at what we just underlined, right? It says that there's a priest named Zacharias. His wife is Elizabeth, right? You following me? There is a priest named Zacharias. Y'all got to follow this. I need y'all to lean in the way y'all leaned in when them little kids were up here just doing all of the shimmies and the dancing and looking adorable times adorable, okay? Let's lean in and look at the adorable one, the reason why we have all of that. Again, ready? There's a priest named Zacharias. His wife is Elizabeth. They're both well stricken in years, and she is barren and without child, right? It says, I had you underline, that he's of the course of Abiah. We know the word tells us that all of Scripture is God-breathed. Every word is God-breathed. Men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of God, right? So nothing is here by accident. Again, he's of the course of Abiah. Now, let me ask you, how many of you in your Bible just have that already underlined and you know why we should get excited about that? Okay, let's go deep. He's of the course of Abiah. The word wants us to know he's of the course of Abiah. Then it tells us again that he, in verse 8, was in the priest, in the temple, doing the what? The order of his course, right? Then it tells us in verse 9 that he was According to the custom of the priest's office, his course was to burn incense before the Lord. Well, the story here is that the angel Gabriel is going to appear to him in the temple as he's burning incense and to announce that he is going to be the father of who Jesus would say would be the greatest prophet of all. Because while all prophets in the Old Testament told us that a Messiah was coming, right? Um, Isaiah said that here's the sign. A virgin will bring forth a child, Isaiah 7, 14. 600 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah said, here is the sign. 
a virgin will bring forth a child. A virgin who has never known a man will bring forth a child, and his name will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Moses said all the way back in Deuteronomy 18, another prophet, capital P, will God raise up, and him will you listen to. All of the prophets had prophesied, but the angel Gabriel is going to come and tell Zacharias that even though he's well stricken in years and his wife is well stricken in years, that they're going to bring forth the greatest prophet. Why? Because while all the other prophets prophesied of a coming Messiah, John the Baptist would be the only one to take his finger and point at Jesus in John 129 and say, behold, that he is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. But here's the thing, before this happened, the word is telling us in at least three places here that he was of the course of Abiah, that he was operating in his priestly duties according to his course, and he was doing it according to verse 9, the custom of the priests. Why is that important? Please write down 1 Chronicles chapter 24. In 1 Chronicles 24, it tells you that All of the priests operated on courses, and there were 24 courses. If you, maybe you work at a plant or somewhere where there just needs to be a high level of organization, not only are there shifts, but there are rotations, and then all the shifts move in a sequence and in an order, decently and in order. God had the same thing in the temple. All the priests were a part of a particular course, The course rotated on a 24-course cycle, and all of the courses served for seven days, right? Where am I going with all of this? Well, the word is going to tell us that Elizabeth is going to become pregnant, and then it's going to tell us, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Oh, this is all going to bless you in a minute. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it tells you in the sixth month, The angel Gabriel went to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Underline in the sixth month. So what do we have so far? We have a priest named Zacharias who's of the course of Abiah, and he's married to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is first visited by Gabriel and told that she will supernaturally be able to have a child and will give birth to the greatest prophet, John the Baptist, the very forerunner Malachi prophesied of, the very forerunner that Isaiah even prophesied of in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Are y'all getting excited? All right, let's keep it moving. You got your thinking caps on? Okay. He's of the course of Abiah, and then it says in the sixth month, The sixth month that now Gabriel goes and makes another visit, but he goes to Mary and announces that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and she will give birth as a virgin and become pregnant with the Messiah, the promised seed of the woman from the Garden of Eden. But it tells us here that it was in the sixth month when Gabriel went and paid that visit. The sixth month of what? The sixth month of what? If you read Luke 1, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So when Elizabeth is pregnant for six months with John the Baptist, who who gets the visit and becomes impregnated with God in the womb as the promised seed in the Messiah? Mary. Elizabeth and Mary are cousins. How much older is John the Baptist than Jesus? Six months, right? Why is he six months older? Because the Bible tells me he's six months older, right? Why is all this important? Because here it is. Y'all ready? Here I am just excited about Jesus. Here I am with my candy cane, you know, and it's like, oh, this is a shepherd's crook. So it really points out, wow, you know, the traditions and, you know, wow, and, and the red and the white, you know, the blood washing you whiter than snow. And here you are just walking down the street, minding your business. And somebody walks up to you and says, yo, you know, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, right? And man, I mean, they might as well have just taken your candy cane, put it on the ground and just stomped it and all up into the middle of the street and walked away, right? Now, some will say, well, it don't matter. But in the back of your mind, you got questions. Some allow that to so do a work that instead of you sharing the good news during a season like this, you 
hold it dear in your heart, but you just turn the volume down a little bit because you don't have answers for some of these tough questions. Well, here's one thing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus was born December 25th. So whenever someone tries to give you a hard time of that, first thing you do is tell them that. Now, if the Bible said that, okay, and then, then now we got some, some things to work out. But one, if the Bible said it, it would be so. But the Bible, there's no contradictions. We need to, while we look at traditions, we need to make sure that we look at the biblical perspective we should have in the tradition so that at any moment we can separate it, right? I mean, here you are. How many of y'all have a Christmas tree up? How many of you have been told that Jeremiah chapter 10 says that, you know, you're not supposed to have a tree up because Jeremiah 10 says, don't learn the ways of the heathen. They put up a tree, they decorate it with silver and with gold. And then how many of you have been, I remember when my wife and I first gave our lives to the Lord, we didn't have a tree for a few years because we read that and we're like, oh, we can't do it. But here's the thing. We also didn't eat shrimp or catfish because Leviticus 11 said it was non-kosher. So we had to learn how to look at things biblically. The dietary laws were only for God's people under the Mosaic Covenant. Jeremiah 10 is saying don't worship the tree. It's not saying you can't have the tree. Just don't let the tree have you. Got it? So now back to this December 25th thing. Yes, when Constantine made Rome made Christianity the mandatory religion of Rome. He claimed that he went into battle and he saw a vision that said, in hoc signum victus, in this sign conquer. He won and said, that means the sign of the cross is it. He made every snake worshiping, demon worshiping person immediately get baptized. So because people were forced into a religion, not a personal relationship, which is what the Bible teaches, they brought a lot of their pagan stuff with them because they didn't want to let go of nothing. And December 25th was when they worshiped Saturnalia, where you get the worship of astrology and Saturn. And it was the winter solstice right, where they worshiped, and actually it was a lascivious, uh, very lustful, uh, pagan form. So what he did was he actually took Christmas and put it over December 25th. So we know what December 25th has stood for uh, as around Roman culture. Now, why, again, is it so important to talk about Zechariah? John the Baptist being six months older than Jesus, right? And the course of Abiah. Here it is. If you look at 1 Chronicles 24, starting all the way back in the days of David, basically picture a business that's in operation for centuries with the shifts going on and on and generations keeping the shift because the children of priests were also priests. You following me? You follow those courses there's, you, could, you talk about setting your clock to something, and each course served for seven days. You could look at, it says Zechariah was the course of Abiah. You could go all the way back to 1 Chronicles 24, begin following the rotation of the courses, and actually see when he was in the temple, when it was his shift on the year when Jesus was born. And it will tell you that he was in there in the spring if you simply follow and go all the way. You do your own Google research on that. What would that mean? It would mean that if Elizabeth became pregnant in the spring, right, early spring, according to following the course of Abiah, and that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus, right, that would place Jesus' birth somewhere around, if you look at it, conjecture, some type of September, October, which for those that love the harmony of God's heart in Scripture would point and line up more with the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, which separates God's dwelling among his people. So my point is, that's not even the message today, all right? But that's just so you know that we know our Bibles, and it says in Romans 14, one man holds one day as more special than another. Another person holds every day as just as special. So on Christmas, you know, the church gets into this silent little separation of philosophies of ministry. Some say, well, Jesus is the reason for the season. Others say, hey, man, what's all the hubbub? No, I'm not dressing up the, uh, on the Sunday ch Christmas service because I esteem every day alike and every day needs to look like this. And they're like, well, we feel the same way, but we really believe and hold this as a special time. The other one's like, yeah, but every day is a special time because every day we're supposed to celebrate it. And look, 
let's just all love one another. But the bottom line is this. Romans says, one man holds one day as more special than another. Another one holds every day alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. So whatever you feel, that's the freedom we have in Christ. The bottom line is that we just adore him and that we stand in awe of him and that we follow him and imitate him. Amen. But I just had to share all of that because even if there's two, three, five people here, and just because you don't have answers to these kind of objections, you're, you feel that you have to turn down the volume. You know, there are even some that walk away from the body of Christ, the local church, because they don't know their scriptures and they don't know how to separate tradition from what the Bible teaches. Now, how many here needed to hear this today? How many needed to hear that point? All right, so now you just can really kind of sit up in your seat and turn your volume and crank it back up, right? Okay. So now let's look at Luke chapter 1 and let's start at verse 26. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Where's where's Mary getting visited? In Nazareth. Underline that. Where is she living now? In Nazareth. Underline that. Watch. To a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, you that are highly favored. Underline that. Highly favored. Tradition says that Mary was around 15 or 16 years old at this time. Highly favored. Mary gets a lot of bad press because in the overcorrection of the erroneous teachings that she was a perpetual virgin, no, Mary had children after Jesus, you know, of her uh, being sinless and traditions of her levitating down steps. You know, in the overcorrection, what happens? Mary gets no mention at all. When the scripture says that she's highly favored, she was elected. All women would dream in their hearts of being able to be able to be the one who would give birth to the seed promised back in the Garden of Eden. Let's give Mary a round of applause. But anyway, let's let's read. It says, verse 29. Well, first he says, Blessed are thou among women. He doesn't say above women, right? That is an erroneous teaching, but among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and she cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you found favor with God. Behold, behold, he's saying, check this out, is what it means in the everyday. You will conceive in your womb, and you're going to bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It means God saves. Salvation is of the Lord. It's Yeshua, which is Yahashua, which is Joshua. And just as Moses took the Israelites up to the land of milk and honey, but he could not take them in, Joshua came and took them in because it was truly a work of God. See, Moses represents the law. The law can never take you into God's abundant rest. The law can never take you into all of God's salvation. You can never work your way into this. So the law could lead you up to it. The law leads you up to realizing you need a savior. You need a deliverer. The law shows you you're a sinner. The law shows you how weak you are. The law shows you how wicked you are. The law can only bring you up to the edge. That's why Moses was not permitted to take them in. Joshua took them in because he's a type of our Jesus who came and did all the work for us. So his name is Joshua, Yahashua, Jesus. Amen? It says, verse 32, he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David. All of this is fulfilling scripture because God even told David that the Messiah the one promised in the Garden of Eden, the one that Moses said would be the greater prophet than him, the one that Isaiah said, you know, would come born of a virgin, this same Lord told David that he actually would also be the king of kings that would sit on David's very throne. Verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I've never known a man, how shall I become pregnant when I'm a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which will be born of you will be called the Son of God. 
And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. The scripture is again just mentioning two times that Elizabeth was six months more pregnant than Mary. And then verse 37, would you wonder on this? For with God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. So here we are today, and the discussion is COVID. The discussion is government. And the murmurings are COVID, and the murmurings is government, and the murmurings is just all of what's happening, and, you know, freedom, and what is freedom, and all of this going on. And in the midst of it, we're just trying to eke out a living. In the midst of this, we just want to provide for our kids. In the midst of this, we just want our people safe. We just want our loved ones safe. We just want our church safe. We just want, you know, just to gather safely. But there's so much going on. Then Philadelphia, wow, how much is going on. You know, my son sent me a meme this morning. And it was a meme, a cartoon meme of Santa Claus standing in the mirror putting on a bulletproof vest. And on the bottom it said, Dag, I got to go to Philly. Oh. And we laugh, or we're just like, yeah, or maybe for some it's like, yeah, well, like, don't say that again, it give me an anxiety attack. But this is where we are. But this is what we need to realize, verse 37 of Luke 1, with God, nothing will be impossible. With God, he's still the same. And now we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, and may you be blown away with realizing that the times we're in are really no different than the times in which Jesus was born. And back then with God, nothing shall be impossible. And today with God, nothing shall be impossible. Y'all getting all this? All right? Cool. I, yeah, I just said cool. All right, anyway, let, let's go, right? So here's the thing. Luke chapter 1 just told me what? That... Mary was where when she got visited by the angel Gabriel? She was in Nazareth. Mind you, no septa, no jets, no puddle jumpers, right? Um, it was just donkey, especially when we learned that Mary was struggling financially. How do we know that? Because after Jesus is born, you came and brought an offering for cleanliness, and the poor people could not bring a large animal, so they would just bring two pigeons. So the fact that she brings two pigeons with Joseph for the offering of cleanliness in Luke chapter 2, that's how you know that she actually was struggling. So here's the thing. How do you get a broke, pregnant mom from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Because Micah, the prophet, and if one prophecy doesn't come true, God's a liar, right? Right? Micah prophesied hundreds of years beforehand that not only Isaiah's prophecy that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, that was 600 years before Christ came. Micah also, hundreds of years beforehand, said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So we just learned in Luke 1 that Mary is poor and she's in Nazareth 80 miles away. That's like the distance from here to New York City. I mean, look, even in cars and dollar buses, you know, before the drive, you're like, ah, oh, really? You know, so take all that away. How do you get a woman who is in her third trimester and broke from Nazareth to Bethlehem because the prophet said the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Would you write down in your notes Proverbs 21, verse 1? It says, the king's heart, every king's heart, whether it's North Korea, China, USA, Every king's heart is in the hand of God, and like the river of water, he could twist and turn it any way he pleases. What? Why? Because what is our verse for today? Luke 137, with God, nothing will be impossible, right? How does God do this? How does he pull this off? Know what he does? He makes the entire world, he makes the entire universe revolve around a pregnant woman. But it's not a pregnant woman. It's a pregnant woman who is actually carrying God in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. John 1.14, after it says in the beginning was the word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word tabernacled among us. What does God do? He makes the whole world revolve around a pregnant woman. You want to see how much control God has? Because what does Luke one thirty seven say again? With God, nothing will be impossible. Right? Are y'all getting this? What situation are you in right now? Is just the COVID monster. And it's, I don't downplay it because it is a real thing. You know what I mean? But I, when I say the monster, the COVID Goliath, what is it now? And I believe all of us will share, it's, it's, a, it's a compounding effect of a lot of things. We're in just crazy times. But we need to all be reminded, even down to the smallest issue on your heart, It says, cast all your cares and worries upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast every one of them. What do we need to be reminded of? That with God, nothing is impossible. I'm holding back enough. Let's jump into it now. Luke 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days, there went out a decree. Coincidence? Coincidence? There went out an order from the throne of Rome. There went out an executive order, a worldwide executive order, from Caesar Augustus, that the whole world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made, verse 2, when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. And everyone, verse 3, went to be taxed, everyone to their own city. It wasn't just a tax. He calls for a global census. So because it was a census, everyone had to go to the city of their name, the city of your tribe of which you were in the generations of, and Joseph and Mary were both of the city of David to Bethlehem. Everyone is moving now. The whole world is moving. There's traffic. Call it donkey traffic. Call it camel traffic. There's traffic everywhere. Everyone's going to their city. And why is God doing all of this? He's doing it to fulfill the promise that the Messiah would be born not in Nazareth, where she's in her third trimester, but in Bethlehem. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Luke 137, with God, nothing is impossible. Are you getting rocked by this? Are you you bringing this into your life? Because the name of the game is to really be praying for God to really brand this into our heart. Because you know what's waiting right outside that door? Worry. Man, my mom, she's so far away. I, I feel so powerless. My children, this item, that issue, finances, the future, job instability. Do you know what's waiting right outside? My health the health of my loved one. What if, what if, what if? Then you turn the TV on and basically it just takes gasoline and throws it on your worries, right? We need to be convinced that with God, nothing shall be impossible. And the Bible declares that as the days grow darker, Daniel 11, verse 32, the people who know their God, who know him, who know him experientially, they will remain strong and do exploits. And to know him is to know one thing, he's sovereign. How sovereign? Just as our day, the murmurings of government and control and this, everyone, you don't think the murmurings, and what's the climate when Jesus was born? Roman government, the Iron Curtain, a census, a taxing, the same stuff we're talking about today. There's nothing new under the sun. But God touches the throne of Rome to make the whole world set in motion just to get a woman in her third trimester who's pregnant with God in the flesh from Nazareth, 80 miles to Bethlehem. And where does he do it? He does it from Rome. To show what? That he is the great I am, and that with him, nothing is impossible. Now, isn't that a different set of lenses to start watching current events with? A different set of lenses to watch everything with? May Luke 2 just be that chapter you fall in love with all over again. You see, that's the name of the game when this season comes around. It's not just to rehearse the stories, but to get rocked by the stories. And not just get rocked by the stories, but to get more rocked than we've ever been. But we're just getting started. Let's go. So it says, verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, which is the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David. Verse 5, so that he could be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, who's now great with child. Put in quotes, any day now, right? Anyone that has just watched a woman with child, there's first trimester, second, third trimester, and then there's any day now. The word saying there, she was great with child. 
And so it was that while they were there, coincidence, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Luke 137, with God, nothing is impossible. He seizes Caesar's mind like Caesar is just a puppet, puts the idea in his head to tax the whole world because every king, every emperor, every government is subject to God and he could twist and turn it any way he wants, which should comfort us because when it looks like evil is run amok, it just means that God is permitting it to happen. And God's plans are perfect. So he goes there to be taxed. While she's there, she's going to be delivered. And look at verse 7. She brought forth, and here is one of the most piercing verses. Are you ready? She brought forth her firstborn son, our Savior, our Jesus. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and she laid him in a manger. Would you underline manger? She laid him in a manger. And it says that there was no room for them in the inn. Now, how many of you have a nativity set? All right. The manger, what's it made of? Probably some kind of wicker wood or something like, you know, wicker wood 2.0. Or it's plastic for the weather, but it's still trying to look like wicker wood with the airbrush. And what's on the inside? Hay. Cushions. Is it, is it hard hay? It probably is a soft hay, right? To really understand what a manger was, do you know what he was laid in when he was born? He was laid in a feeding trough, a stone feeding trough where beasts, large beasts fed. But Jesus would tell us in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He came to be the bread of life. And he says, whoever eats of me will live forever, right? By the remission of sins and be given eternal life. And he came and when he was born, where was he laid? He was laid in a place where beasts feed. But you see, that's no different because 20-something years ago is when this beast, who's only a beast at heart, fed on the bread of life. Look at where he chose to be laid. And then it says this, there was no room for them in the inn. Now, you might think days in, you might think the Weston or Wiston or whatever, I don't know, right? Actually, in the Greek, it's a Catalina or a Cataluma. Would you write that in your notes? C-A-T-A-L-U-M-A. There was no room in the Cataluma. Do you know what a Cataluma was? It was a hostel where travelers could stay. It says there was no room in the Cataluma. This is what a Cataluma was like. The first floor was nothing but stables. Now do you understand why there would be a feeding trough there? Just travel weary beasts of burden. Have you ever been in a barn with large livestock and cows and everything and mud patties and everything else in there? The second and third floor is where people stayed and slept, but the first floor was just a stable. When it says there was no room for them in the Cataluma, it means that, it doesn't mean that Jesus was born in a stable. It means that Jesus was not even born in the stable because there was no room even in the stables. He was most likely born in a back alley behind the Cataluma because it says there was not even room, or even the animals had it all locked down. So God Almighty could choose to be born because he's God. He seizes Caesar's heart like nothing. Could have been born anywhere. He chooses to be born to an impoverished mom from a ghetto called Nazareth, laid in a feeding trough and born and pushed out in a back alley. Is there anyone here that has a hard time coming to Jesus? Is there anyone here that somehow churchianity or something has convinced you that you just can't come to him in your lowest place, in your lowliest place, in your ugliest place, in your most bestial place? You started out understanding that Jesus was the friend of sinners. You started out understanding and celebrating that you could cast everything to him. But has the devil or your own flesh convinced you that now you're so ugly, there's just certain things you've got to work out before you can talk? Have you forgotten who Jesus is? How do you say why Jesus said, come and learn of me? Because I'm meek and lowly. The shortest autobiography ever written, for I am meek and lowly. A six-word autobiography. I'm meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. So he is born. 
And time won't allow me to get into what I'd like to get into, but what it also means is that when Christ came into a world of sinners, maybe I'll pose it to you this way. How many have been on the bus and you've seen an elderly person and you've given up your seat? Or you've been on the train and you've given up your seat? Or you've seen a pregnant woman and given up your seat? And you've, or you've seen a woman that you're wondering why they're even outside because they're so pregnant and you've given up your seat. When it says there was no room for them in the inn, what it also means is there was no hospitality given to them. A world of self-serving people. Everyone's caught up in mumbling about taxes, mumbling about money, mumbling about travel expenses to get to their own city. Everyone's probably complaining about how much work it took to get there. Well, I came from Nazareth. Well, that's nothing. I was all the way up by the Lebanon-Syrian border in Tel Dan. We got here. Well, we got here this way. And, you know, well, my life stinks, and here's my complaints, and, and happy hour suddenly becomes the most miserable place. Don't you find that to be true anyway? They call it happy hour, kind of an oxymoron. I guess looking for happy. This, but we get the idea, right? But in the midst of this, Jesus was forgotten, and there was no hospitality shown. What we need to be careful of is the same thing. One, it showcases God's love that even when man is at his worst, God still is giving his only begotten son. The scriptures would be so justified in it saying that suddenly Mary didn't, wasn't pregnant anymore. Not stillborn, nothing, not a miscarriage. She just wasn't pregnant anymore. God reversed the plan. Nobody was hospitable, came to the inn, and note all those travelers with blisters couldn't even say, man, the pregnant woman with the blisters got to be going through it the most. Mary suddenly wasn't pregnant anymore and just went back to, to the ghetto. But he continues to give because here in his love, not that we loved God, love's not defined by what we show God. We often show God a very poor excuse for love. Herein is love, not that we love him, but here's the definition of love, 1 John 5.10, that he loved us and gave his only begotten son, that he loves us when we're at our worst. Have you forgotten who Jesus is? I can forget. We can forget in the busyness of it all. Can we forget to love one another and be hospitable? Have you been forgetting just through the murmurings of what's going on? Their murmurings was tax and dollars and travel and travel expenses, and they forgot to be hospitable and missed out on the opportunity to even serve the Lord. In the midst of your busyness and your worry and all the things on your mind, are you forgetting hospitality? Are you forgetting biblical, Jesus-imitating, radical hospitality? Forgetting to love. In a world where it's just so easy to be nasty back and just, you know, just be just stone-faced. Are we forgetting what it's all about? I'm just going to read one more story, and then I'm out of your way. Verse 8, there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Not only were these just shepherds nearby, but Alfred Edersheim tells us that in the Jewish commentaries, in the Mishnah, in Shekalim 7.4, that the flocks they were watching were the very sheep that would be offered for the Passover sacrifice in the temple. So who are the first ones to receive news that the true Lamb of God has come to take away our sins? The very shepherds whose ministry, maybe some considered it a boring ministry, the very ones whose ministry it was to watch the very sheep that were a type of Christ going on the altar. Look at how God is so in order and so exact with everything. Why? Because with God, nothing is impossible. Your life might feel like a mess right now. It might feel like your morning is just running until you pass out at night. But the Bible says if you belong to Jesus, Jeremiah 29, 11, he knows the thoughts and plans he has for you, plans to bless you and not to curse you. And then here it's to give you an expected end. Might seem like your own spin cycle and a chicken with no head to you, but he's got the perfect plan for your life. And we see even the order in all of the announcements. And lo, the angel of the Lord, verse 9, came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings. That's what the gospel is. It's good news. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ. That is Christos in the Greek. It's Messiah in, or Mashiach in the Hebrew. Christ the Lord. And then he says in verse 12, this will be a sign. In the Greek, it's this will be the sign. Because what? You're going to tell him just what? Run the, 
Bethlehem and just start looking for crying babies? He's got to give them a sign now, right? This will be the sign. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, okay, every, every baby that's born gets wrapped in something. He says, no, this will be the sign. You're going to see God in the flesh in a feeding trough. He's going to be in a manger. He, this is how you'll know there's going to be babies. And you're going to even think that maybe this one looks like it's a few moments old. This one looks, ah, looks like this one's about three weeks old. No, this is how you're going to know. Not by the cry, not by just the swaddling clothes. You're going to see this one in a feeding trough. Do you get the story now? Look at God displaying. Look at what he's doing. Could have been Caesar's rose garden. Where is he? In Bethlehem in a back alley in a feeding trough. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, verse 15, as the angels were going away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And what does it say? They came with haste. Do you still come with haste to the house of God? Do you still come with haste to the corporate worship of God? We live in a day where, you know, a lot of people, you know, they just go with haste to the remote. And look, this is not the part of the message where we start getting all into who's home. But when we say this, you know, you could watch a fire on TV, but you can't feel the warmth. You could watch a fire on TV. People pull up pictures of fires, beautiful fires. If you got a nice TV, it could look like you could touch it. Only thing is you can't feel the warmth. You can't hear the crackle. You see, we come with haste to the meeting place of God because he dwells in a unique, rich, and warm way in the presence of his people. They went with haste. Do we still, are we still excited? Do we still want to go with haste? They go with haste. And... Verse 16, they found Mary and Joseph, and sure enough, they found the babe babe lying in what? A feeding trough. I've been to Israel two times, and when I was at one of the Canaanite ruins, there indeed is an ancient feeding trough. And I tell you, it is nothing but, picture a cinder block, picture five cinder blocks kind of melted into each other, and then just have just the whole inside kind of raked out. Rough as anything, even rougher than any cinder block, not, not the chiseling machines. That is a feeding trough. It's too, too heavy to lift. And this is where he was. And when they had seen it, verse 17, they made known abroad the saying that was said concerning this child. Are you still letting people know the message? Verse 18, and all they heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Wow. So now, let's just clear up a little confusion. If you're saying, well, wait, where do the wise men come? And the wise men, it says, they found Jesus in a house. But the shepherds found Jesus in the back alley behind the Cataluma in a feeding trough. If you read Matthew 2 carefully, it tells you that he was a young child by then. And he was in a house by then. That's why when Herod wants to have all of the children killed... He starts with two and under. That's a little later when the wise men come and worship him. We we, we like knowing our Bibles here, don't we? Because the truth will set you free, right? The Bible is very clear when you read it in its clarity, right? But here's the thing, and this is where we're going to end. Please go to Matthew 25. And this is where we're going to end. And we are going to end here, Charles Pildes. All right? Praise God. I just love our family. I love the fact that we can be family and how we have fun as family. But most of all, we have fun in the word as a family, right? Luke tells us this, and here it is. And just let this hit you. The same stuff people were murmuring about when Christ was born is the same stuff people are murmuring about today. The same concerns, Rome, government, money, finance, taxation, same stuff everyone's murmuring about today. And what did he say then? With God, nothing is impossible and showed that he is in complete control. What is he saying to us today? He's saying the same thing, yes? But it says this in Luke, that there was no room in the Cataluma. There was no hospitality. Before we read these verses, would you write down Mark 10, 45? 
Because what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to show us the heart of God. Jesus came to show us God. Colossians 1.15, Hebrews 1.3, John 14.9, Hebrews 2.14, 1 Timothy 3.16. You want those again? Colossians 1.15, Hebrews 1.3, John 14.9, 1 Timothy 3.16, Hebrews 2.14. But he came to serve. You know, we're living in a day where we're forgetting what it means to be Christ-like. And what ends up happening is a church that is Christ-like, you actually start looking strange. We're living in a day that's forgetting what it means to follow Jesus' example. And what happens? The ones that do are all of a sudden subject to questioning. Are you sure you're doing this? Are you sure it's the Spirit of God? We live in a day where you walk into someone's house and if people don't have smartphones out and the family's actually at the table looking in each other's eyes in silence like this, you'd be like, whoa, this is a twilight zone? strange. But if you walk in and everyone's ignoring each other and just got the, 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 the glow on, you know, then you're like, oh, another normal home. You know, we're in a day where there's so much abnormality as the new normal that we're forgetting normal. We're in a day where churchianity is so taken over, a loveless churchianity, a churchianity with no hospitality, that the minute we're hospitable, the minute we're actually doing what Jesus said, everyone scratches their head and wonders, is it the spirit of God? That's the difference between churchianity and the Bible. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, I came not to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. How many today in the church are falling into the trap of thinking that it's all about getting them served? They pick their church on how the church serves them. They pick the church on how many ministries are in the bulletin that serve them, on how much is going on that serves them. And people leave a church because when you're kind of distilled down through all the verbiage, they weren't getting what they wanted. When Jesus said, I came not to get what I want, I came to serve. I came to serve. And how did Jesus serve? Well, let's look at Matthew 25. And let's look at what Jesus says. And what he's referring to here is the second coming. And he's referring to when he will judge nations at his second coming. And look at the criteria of how nations will be judged. And in this, we see when Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to serve. Let's look at what Jesus means when he says serve. What? In a a world where radical hospitality is lacking in the world, because there was no room in the inn and nobody cared. And guess what? Radical, ordinary hospitality is even becoming scarce in the church. Would you write this in your notes? We're not Greek philosophers. We're Christ imitators. We're not Greek philosophers. We're Christ imitators. Why? You know why? You know what Acts 17, 21 tells us about the Greek philosophers? When Paul went there, it said all they did all day long was sat around and talked and shared what they heard new and interesting. Well, no wonder across The spectrum, they say that only 10% of the church does 90% of the work. Many are doing whatever and all in self, but many are also falling in the trap of acting more like Greek philosophers than Christ imitators. And you get it twisted because you're talking about the things of God, because you enjoy sharing the things of God, because the coffee is warm, and God loves us. He gives us really good coffee, doesn't he? But you can mistake just sitting around and sharing tidbits of information, and well, I agree on this. Well, human responsibility is this. God's sovereignty is this. Well, this, and I think the tongues is glossia, and I think the tongues is this. And you could fall in the trap of just being a philosopher that all your Christianity is, is just learning new information and sharing how smart you are. And there's a place for that, but we're not Greek philosophers. We're to take the information, let it become revelation, and it dictates us in Christ's imitation. Are you following me? And this is what Jesus said. The very one who came and there was no room in the inn, and there was no hospitality. Is this convicting at this point? Yeah, would you just stop and just say, wow, this message both gave me good news and also gave me good views of myself. But this is why we celebrate Christ, because he came and paid the price for all of this. 
And he invented this thing called the church. He invented this gathering place where we get together and the word pricks you and the word cleans you up and the word flushes out the system and some of it could feel uncomfortable. But the beautiful thing is you're free to embrace it all because it's all been paid for in the blood of Jesus. It's like going to an art class and it's saying, you ever go to an art class and they say, hey, this is the only sheet of paper you got. It's the only sheet of paper. No, no, you, you got three. You got three sheets of paper. And we're drawing in 3D. You got three sheets of paper. Now you're nervous. You're on edge. You're not even having fun. But what if you go to the art class and they say, don't abuse it. Don't abuse it. <laughs> but there's as much paper as you want. There's as many canvases as you want. There's as much pain as you need. That Don't start throwing it out the window. Don't get in pain fights. But shh, there's as much paint as you need. There's as many teachers as you want. There's as many hours. It's there. That is the gospel. So that's why we could sit here in church and we don't have to act like someone that's only got one sheet of paper left or you're on your last sheet of paper and it's already a mess up. It's as much paper as you want. That's why I had you say in the beginning of the message, it's not too late. Would you look at someone and tell them it's not too late? All right, I'm going to read this. Then I'm really done. And Charles, if I go again, you come up and tackle me. Let's go. Matthew, look at Jesus's gauge of what, write this in your notes, radical, ordinary hospitality, not just radical hospitality, because then I fall in the trap of thinking that it's just for the radical. It's radical, ordinary hospitality. It's radical, but it's the norm. It's the life of Jesus. How is Jesus going to gauge us? The very one who came not to be served, but to serve. Look at this. Let's go to Matthew 25. Then, verse 34, and please look at this in your own Bible, Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And look at this. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry when, and fed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? Verse 38, when did we see you as a stranger and take you in? When did we see you naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, verse 40, will say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. This is radical, ordinary hospitality. We are the ones that had no room for Jesus, didn't want him in our room. We're the ones that saw Mary and said, nope, I ain't giving up my room. Man, they look like they're struggling. Man, she's pregnant. But guess what? I'm tired. I'm tired too. We're the ones. There was no room in our heart. There was no room in our inn. We're the ones that were inhospitable. And all our murmuring was because we weren't getting the hospitality we want. But by eating of Christ from the feeding trough, bestial thinking people that we are, we've now been changed and been filled with God's spirit. And we now get to be Christ imitators by the power of God. And now we can walk in radical, ordinary hospitality like our Jesus. So the story is the statement that God is in control and with him nothing is impossible. And the story is the stimulant. A stimulant is defined as something that gets the system going. This story should get you going to want to act and serve and be more like Jesus. Now, does it cause you to just want to give thanks for what God's allowed this church to do? Ministries like dope, ministries like high flock ministries, out serving, out giving clothing to those that don't have clothing, giving winter coats to kids who aren't ours, who are cold, giving food to people who haven't eaten all day. Our kids, how can they pay attention in a school system, which is already a failing school system, and they haven't eaten in a day and a half? Giving something to drink to those that are thirsty, visiting those that are sick, those that are in prison. Now do we realize even all the more that what we're doing, it's nothing special. It's just radical, ordinary hospitality. It's just trying to be like Jesus. So for everyone here, let's just 
give thanks anew for what he's done for us. Let's give thanks for the opportunities he's given us to be able to walk in radical, ordinary hospitality. Let's have the worship team come up now. Let's give thanks. Let's celebrate. We've gotten a dose of God's sovereignty. We've gotten a dose of just Christ's heart. And here's a whole weekend in front of us now. And guess what? It's not too late to not only proclaim the truth of the season, but to actually use this time to love people. Because what is our goal? What did Jesus do? He came and turned strangers into neighbors and neighbors into the family of God. What are we called to do? To go out into the world and turn strangers into neighbors. But we don't just stop there. We want to turn neighbors into the family of God. So it's not too late, is it? He's sovereign. He's king. He's everything. Father, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done. We thank you for a message, Lord, going against the grain of so much over inundation that we're getting from TikTok and the news and everything else. But Lord, 60 minutes, thank you that you've just gotten our minds and hearts right, grounded, encouraged, excited. Thank you, Lord, for coming down and dying for our sins so that sinners, animals like us, can be forgiven and have the very righteousness of God. Lord God, please help us to imitate you. Please, it all begins with make you being the central thing in our hearts. Would you take your rightful place as the center of our hearts again? Would you take your rightful place as the king on our throne again, the throne of our heart? Would you take your rightful place in our homes again? Would you take your rightful place in our downtime again, your rightful place in our busyness again? Thank you, Lord. We love you. And again, remind us that whatever we've done to the least of those, we're doing it unto you. Christians don't do favors for people. We serve you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's receive this morning's offering now, which is also an act of worship. You can give through the Cash App, which is dollar sign Antioch Philly. You can give on the website. Um, and uh, this is just a, that's a time of worship. It's something between you and God. Um, we're going to have a vision night in the next couple of weeks. We're going to have actually a report because the last year has been so amazing what he's allowed us to do in attempting radical, ordinary hospitality. We as a church need to see me, number of meals served, num, what has been given to benevolence and all of these things. But, and then we're going to have a vision night because our prayer is that 2022 uh, is even better than 2021. You know, and all of us are a part of this. Every prayer, every dollar, we're all a part of We're all in this together. So um, let's look forward to that to come. But for now, let's just worship God and let's worship him even with our giving. God bless you.